Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar co-sponsored by Biodefense Network and the Public Health Foundation titled Practical Approaches for Zika Preparedness and Response. We have an excellent complement of speakers today. My name is David Reddick. I'm Chief Strategy Officer and co-founder of Biodefense Network, and I'm pleased to introduce today's webinar. Biodefense Network is the nation's leading public health preparedness consultancy working at the intersection of public health preparedness and emergency, manage, emergency planning and management. Before we get started, we've got those normal housekeeping chores to go over, so I want to be sure that everyone understands what we need to do. If you have a question, look to the right of your screen, click the little box, the plus sign by the question, and fill in your question and send it to us. We'll get to as many as we can during the, the process of the webinar, and any we can't, we'll try to answer later and let you know. Today's webinar will be recorded and archived for future access. If you experience technical issues, close your browser and log back in. We will also be providing copies of the PowerPoint presentations as handouts, so you can download those now or whenever you choose. Finally, for audio, you have the option for listening through your computer speakers, or you can click the telephone option and view the dial-in information. So with all that, let's get started on the webinar. We are all concerned about Zika and the potential for long-range effects of infant microcephaly. Just last week, the New York Department of Health announced the birth of a Zika-related case there. And Florida has ruled out travel as the cause of two cases uh, in South Florida, one in Miami-Dade County and one in Broward County. Those are believed to be the first cases of locally acquired uh, Zika in the continental United States. Perhaps most sobering, the Washington Post reported Sunday that it estimated the cost of care through adulthood for a child born with microcephaly in the United States at $10 million, a sobering number. Here to introduce today's panelists, are Vanessa Lammers. Vanessa works with the Performance Management and Quality Improvement at the Public Health Foundation and is currently coordinating the Vector Control Program Improvement Initiative, which includes five local public health department vector programs. Our panelists are part of that program. Vanessa, take it away. Hi, Dave, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Biodefense Network, for co-hosting this webinar with us. And thank all of you for joining to hear about the practical approaches to Zika virus that are coming from uh, two of our amazing partners. Uh, we know this is a really busy season for folks working in vector control, as it is for both of our presenters today, so we really appreciate their time and your time. Um, I also know, uh, Dave and I were talking about earlier, that as of today, the CDC is reporting 12 live infants born with birth defects that are being attributed to the Zika virus, and that's from the U.S. Zika Pregnancy Registry. So if there's folks on here that aren't familiar with the U.S. Zika Pregnancy Registry, make sure that um, you, you look that up and are watching that going forward. So with that, I'd love to give some brief background on the Public Health Foundation, PHF. I'm going to present some information on our, on our approach and some of our vector control resources and tools, and I'm going to introduce two of our health department partners who are really launching these tools into action. If you're not familiar with PHF, I have three programs here that are all working on Zika preparedness and response. We're a national nonprofit organization. We're based in Washington, D.C., and our mission is to improve the public's health by strengthening the quality and performance of public health practice. So we work with state, local, tribal, territorial health departments, hospitals, health systems, um, really with the, with the mission of improving public health practice. We work across a wide array of public health topics, including environmental health, chronic disease, infectious disease, and others, through the lens of our focus areas, which are performance management, quality improvement, and workforce development. Um, and PHF also manages the TRAIN Learning Network, now with over 1 million users, hoping a lot of you are on TRAIN with us, and uh, has several Zika courses you can enroll in today. My work focuses in this area of performance management and quality improvement and income, uh, impact and outcomes in population health. So we have toolkits, case examples, articles, papers, resources, and performance Im on performance improvement. And I'll show you a little bit more on that later on. Um, and then I really want to get to having these health departments talk. So next. Thank you. Uh, so we are very fortunate um, to work with the CDC and use this quality improvement framework. We know that there are hundreds of pathogenic viruses, and it's really only a matter of time before we have something else that's coming around the corner. So we want to build uh, something that sustains. We want to build and improve processes and programs for vector control. Uh, we want to increase efficiency and effectiveness 
So we use a lot of quality improvement frameworks and resources and tools. There's some listed here. These are all available online, as well as the ones I'm going to show you from PHF, Environmental Public Health Performance Standards, the Self-Assessment Instrument, the 10 Essential Environmental Public Health Services, and these were all used by the health departments that we worked with. We've worked with 15 health departments on vector control so far. Next. And we use these environmental health tools and pair them with our quality improvement tools and techniques that have shown to be really successful for health departments, hospitals. Um, we have our vector control population health driver diagram, which is available at phf.org. It's a framework quality improvement tool that looks at the primary drivers and the secondary drivers of an aim or a goal. So in this case, our health department's goal was to decrease the presence of vectors and prevent vector-borne disease transmission in a community. So who might be your community partners on that? And we'll let uh, the health department talk more about that. I also have just a brief list here of some of the vector control quality improvement uh, tools, techniques, methods. Um, and these are all available at phf.org if you'd like more information on PHF work and vector control. Next. We have all of these resources available. Uh, we just published a paper, Performance Management Initiative for Local Health Department Vector Control Program. Um, it's open access, so you can, you can download that on our website um, and in the Environmental Health Insights Journal. We also have some articles and, um, about our population health driver diagram process. If you'd like to learn more about that, we published a, a, an article recently. Um, and here's my contact information, so feel free to reach out to me if you, you have any questions. Uh, any feedback. We'd like to roll out this approach even further. Uh, we've also created a set of services so that other health departments and agencies can activate these tools. And we really have a vision of scaling this up. Um, so feel free to reach out with me, to reach out to me with any, any questions. So with that being said, um, it is really my pleasure to introduce our two health department partners. Uh, we've been working with both of them uh, for on this vector control performance improvement initiative. And first is uh, Cheryl Clay. She is the Public Health Senior Environmentalist for Madison County Health Department. Her core responsibility is managing the vector control program for the city of Huntsville. She's been an environmentalist for the Alabama Department of Public Health for over 10 years and worked as a health inspector before transferring to vector control four years ago. Her vector control program emphasizes public education and source education as the most effective means to prevent mosquito-borne disease she holds a Bachelor of Science from the University of Kentucky in Natural Resource Conservation and Management. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Okay, thank you very much for having me speak today. Uh, so Huntsville, Alabama is located in uh, Northern Alabama in Madison County, close to Tennessee. And we have about 191,000 residents, and uh, we comprise about 214 square miles. We are the yellow patchwork on the map. Uh, mosquito control uh, is tricky in our area because we do actually, to the west, completely enclose another city. And to the south, we have the uh, Redstone Arsenal, which is a U.S. Army installation, home of uh, Marshall Fleet, uh, Mar Fleet Center, NASA, so we don't go in that area. Oops, sorry about that. So in 2014, we were very fortunate to be one of the health departments uh, that was chosen to participate in the Vector Control Program Performance Assessment Improvement Initiative that Vanessa spoke of. Uh, we did our self-assessment in 2014, and we determined our low-scoring areas were monitoring, mobilization, and enforcement. So when we had to decide on our project to do, um, one of the things that we considered is we are a very small staff of only three people. We do have a few summer temps uh, that help. 
And our greatest challenge at the time and is to this day is the Aedes albopictus mosquito. Uh, I quickly learned my first summer in vector control in 2012 that the fog truck is not very effective at this mosquito, so I had to look for other ways to be able to address this problem. And at the time of the project, uh, chikungunya was the concern, so I knew that I needed to focus the project on this mosquito. So during one of our uh, webinars we have with the Public Health Foundation, this is one of the graphics that they showed, and I have found this very valuable in, in many aspects of my job, but you have this very large area of things that you can neither control nor influence. You have a smaller area of things that you can influence, and then you have this very small area of things that you can control. So in choosing my project, I wanted to pick something that I could control. So we chose service number four, which is mobilize community partnerships and actions to identify and solve environmental public health problems. We felt this would have the greatest effect on our capacity to protect our residents uh, from mosquito-borne diseases. So our aim statement was an opportunity exists to improve the vector capacity of the vector control division of the Madison County Health Department regarding mosquito control by facilitating partnerships among groups and associations to assist in disseminating information to homeowners on mosquito population reduction by eliminating breeding environments. So by focusing on educating homeowners on eliminating areas on their property where mosquitoes can breed and develop, we would support our integrated pest management plan and provide a manageable project that could be completed by one person. So the goal was to create partnerships among community groups who would assist in distributing information or allow us to speak publicly in order to reach more people with our message regarding the removal of breeding environments. We focus on ways to maximize our educational outreach with minimal time investment. With community organization partnerships, we can quickly distribute timely and important information by email that will reach residents of those communities with minimal time input. So a part, our community partnership network uh, consists of, I basically have an email distribution list, and that includes neighborhood associations, civic groups, uh, government officials, and uh, news media. So where to start? Unfortunately, there wasn't a magic complete list of all of the organizations in our area. So I started by emailing all of my city council members because I knew that they would be familiar with the groups in their area. I also sent out a news release that included television stations, radio, county commissioners, city of Huntsville departments, uh, the neighborhood associations, civic organizations that I was aware of, letting them know about uh, our project and what we were trying to do for the community. Okay, uh, we had uh, a list of known associations supplied by the city, so I emailed all of those people. And then we do receive several complaints, so that is a great way to uh, form partnerships because a lot of complaints are from the president of homeowners associations or various groups that are concerned about mosquito problems uh, in their community. So I would let them know about uh, our partnership project and if they would like to participate. Um, at the time, we formed nine new partnerships, and these folks posted flyers in area businesses for us. Uh, they emailed flyers to members of their community. Some of them distributed door hangers for us. Um, a lot of them put information on the next door social media outlet if they had that for their neighborhood. They put information in their association newsletters, and they invited us to uh, community health fairs and community meetings. So we also widely advertised our um, recently formed web page. I have found this extremely valuable because if you put a lot of information that people are looking for on a web page, um, that will really cut down on your office phone calls and you will have more time to uh, work on other projects. So this has been an extremely valuable tool for our time management. Also uh, formed a partnership with our local government channel. Uh, every year I do about a 20 minute uh, interview where we discuss how our residents can prevent uh, mosquito borne illness. And they also do regularly show slides with important mosquito information on the, uh, the channel, which is very helpful. Uh, the city of Huntsville will also post information for me uh, on their Facebook page, which will reach a lot of people. 
Uh, and then we also do uh, interv did an interview with our local uh, NPR affiliate. So we were on the radio, which was really, really neat. Um, and then we had a opening of a new dog park that was unfortunately located adjacent to a swamp. So I knew it was going to be very important to educate the people that would be coming uh, to that area. Basically, we looked for any opportunity where there were going to be a lot of people in one area um, that we could get invited to to give out information. Uh, in 2015, we attended our first Earth Day event. This is interesting because for several years, we do work for several months at this nature preserve uh, to minimize the mosquitoes in the area so the people who attend the event uh, do not receive mosquito bites. And then in 2015, as a part of the project, I thought, well, why don't I attend the event? <laughs> so uh, they were more than happy to have us come, and we talked to hundreds of people in a short time, and it was just a great way to uh, educate them about um, breeding environments. We also partnered with their Latino community, and they distributed uh, information to uh, the folks in that area through their churches. Uh, I sent letters to all of our tire dealers to remind them of the concerns of holding uh, tires on their property for an extended period of time. I also sent information to all of the churches in Huntsville so they could uh, share the information with their congregations. Uh, the best chart for our tool for me was the Gantt chart because uh, it basically I could organize what I needed to do or what I have done and when I needed to do it or when it was completed. So it's just really a great tool to keep you on track and um, to help professional procrastinators like me. So what did we learn from our project? Um, our initial project with the Public Health Foundation helped us recognize that even though we are a very small staff, we can accomplish a great deal with community partners. As we increase our number of partners, we can work toward accomplishing our goal of educating all residents on how they can protect themselves from mosquito-borne disease. So then Zika virus came. <laughs> Uh -oh. oh, sorry about that. I'm having a little bit of a delay here. Let's see if I can. There we go. So when Zika virus came, um, there was a lot of confusion and fear in our area, particularly when this map came out from the CDC. Um, and the community partners were so helpful because we could get information out quickly to our public, let them know what Zika virus meant to us here in northern Alabama, and we really did uh, manage a lot of fear uh, earlier in this area. We've not seen an 80s uh, Egypti mosquito in Alabama for many, many years. We haven't seen one in Huntsville since about 1990, um, so we do have plenty of the 80s Avopictus, though. So uh, as a part of the state response, uh, there are only three of 67 counties in Alabama that have health department vector mosquito control programs. Uh, and most environmentalists in the county do not have vector training. And this time is the environmentalists that we are training to do uh, yard inspections for any Zika positive patients. Um, so we know that uh, focusing on educating the public on removing mosquito breeding environments and methods of preventing mosquito bites is the most important thing we could do given our current level of funding. So we created the Zika virus guide for environmentalists, just a tool to train them about basics about Zika virus, mosquito biology, um, and it mostly uh, focuses on uh, breeding environments and what to recognize if they do any yard inspections. Um, so this has been a very valuable tool for them. Uh, just for instance, you know, environmentalists are out in the field a lot, and uh, one of them was doing a septic tank inspection, and she just happened to notice a hotel was remodeling, and they had a lot of these sinks behind their building. So just raising the awareness of environmentalists when they're out doing their other activities uh, is a very important thing. So we also created a checklist for the environmentalists to use, which is very helpful when they're doing uh, any inspections. Um, and then we thought, well, this checklist would be great to give to the residents to use so they can do their own inspections. So this has been a very valuable tool. Um, and then the Zika guide we made for environmentalists, we thought, well, this would be great for the municipalities and the county commissions, because actually in Alabama, these are the people that are doing a majority of the mosquito control. So we sent that out through the Alabama League of Municipalities to share that information with everyone statewide. 
Uh, the wonderful graphic design people with the state created the Skeeter Beater coloring book uh, about Zika virus, which has just been the best tool uh, to educate our young people about uh, prevention of mosquito-borne disease. It was distributed statewide to pre-K through third grade public schools uh, and to any public schools that requested it. We do have a version in Spanish. Uh, I have learned through doing many uh, uh, complaint investigations in the summer that the kids are most interested in what you're doing and get very excited about finding breeding water on their property. So I know uh, this is a really a great uh, way to go as far as educating the public and then in turn their parents become educated as well. Uh, also, the state has created a contest uh, for the teenagers uh, to create Zika videos, and first place prize is $1,000, so hopefully that will motivate them to learn a little bit about uh, mosquito-borne disease prevention. So a little bit more about our local response here in Huntsville to Zika virus. It has been all about the community partners. That's why the project with the Public Health Foundation was just so timely for us. So uh, this year I've done three local news releases to my community partners. Um, actually, as of yesterday, I've done 15 local news in, uh, interviews. Uh, presented at town hall meetings, neighborhood association, and civic group meetings. Been to some health fairs, and one of my uh, favorite partnerships uh, that I created this year was with our city parks and recreation department because I didn't realize that they have contacts in all neighborhoods, so they send my information all over the city. So we keep our message simple. Um, the people uh, have a lot of information coming at them, and we want to keep it simple um, so they can focus on the core things that are important. So we do talk a little bit about the mosquito life cycle and that the mosquitoes that carry Zika virus particularly will like to lay their eggs and items around your home, particularly those flower pots. Uh, this is a graphic that I use a lot that uh, shows a lot of the common breeding environments, especially those terrible uh, flower pot dishes that we have a huge problem with. And this is also a great graphic for the kids. They have fun with it too. So again, in keeping the message simple, every media interview that I do or when I go speak to the public, I always stress practice the three Ds, um, which I'm sure all of you are all familiar with, train, dress, and defend. So hopefully they keep that in mind to protect themselves from mosquito bites. Uh, this year at the Earth Day event, I actually set up a display of common breeding environments around the home, which was nice because it actually drew people to our table because they were kind of like, what is this? <laughs> so it was great conversation starters. And then also this year, our second project with the Public Health Foundation, we launched our elementary school education project. Uh, we have a curriculum uh, for fourth graders that can easily be changed uh, for basically any age group. And again, we, we focus on uh, the basics, mosquito life cycle, breeding environments, and bite prevention. And that was an incredible success, and the kids were great and had a lot of fun. So one of our biggest challenges is changing the culture of how people think about mosquito control in our area. Everybody thinks the fog truck is going to fix everything and it's the only tool in their toolkit. And we try to let them know the truck is really not that helpful against uh, the type of mosquitoes that, that carry Zika virus. And if they're breeding mosquitoes around their home, the fog truck is really not going to help them. And we're really trying to empower the people to take measures to protect themselves. So again, uh, the thing that I stress to the public is the best way to avoid mosquito bites uh, around the home is to not raise them. I do stress to the public the importance of helping us to minimize the number of mosquitoes uh, in the environment. Uh, everyone that calls us with a mosquito problem, we do offer a courtesy yard inspection. I've stopped using that terminology with them because it immediately turns them off. And I'm trying to get into their yard and I need them to invite me uh, because we cannot go on private property without their permission. So now what I say is, you know, we would like to come to your house to do an assessment of the mosquito prop, uh, problem so we can see what more we can do to help you. And that works actually most of the time because we really aren't uh, in, do enforcement. We more do education. Um, so this is a great way to get in their yard and educate that resident. And um, then a lot of times we find this and this. And this is very common. I think every house built in Huntsville in the 1960s had a swimming pool. Most of them aren't being used anymore. Then we have these. 
So the way that we deal with a lot of this is giving out free stuff. <laughs> Since we really don't have a lot of enforcement capability, uh, giving out free larvicide for people with interoperable swimming pools on the condition that they will let us come back periodically to check it has just been a great way to uh, address the mosquito problems in our area. This is one of the biggest problems that we have that, that homeowners commonly uh, overlook is the corrugated pipes that are not graded to drain. Uh, this is probably one of the biggest things that, that, that they don't notice when they think they've checked their yard in addition to the dishes on the flower pots. So we try to stress that in addition to the backwards splash block <laughs> is a problem sometimes. So at the state level, the state has a uh, web page now specifically dedicated to Zika virus and all the resources we have available, and also they address other mosquito-borne diseases, which is a great tool for the public because so many people just like to go online uh, and get the information that they need. Uh, also uh, online on our web page for Huntsville, we have a couple of Zika videos uh, that are very short, um, so people just want to watch a video. Uh, and get the information we need. So we have that available too. So this has been one of our largest initiatives this year, which I think has been very successful. I'm lucky enough to have a summer temp that is distributed so far as of yesterday over 2,000 door hangers in susceptible neighborhoods. People that we have identified that typically have a lot of items in their yard that will breed mosquitoes. Uh, in the door hanger we include a mosquito brochure, Zika information, and the residential checklists that are briefly mentioned. And uh, one thing that I learned, someone called and complained that we were soliciting. Um, I kind of understood in a way where they were coming from, and I realized that I can't just assume that they understand what we were doing. So I started putting in a cover letter, and the cover letter with our letterhead is what they see first on the door hanger, because there's really no point in doing this if they're just going to throw it away and not even look at it. So that I think that has really helped. Um, this is the information I put in the cover letter, basically saying, hey, we're providing this information to help protect you and your family from diseases. And what was awesome about this is that we actually unintentionally <laughs> door hangered one of our local uh, news media, and she called me and, and she said, this is great. I learned some things that I didn't know. Can we do a news story about it? And we're like, sure. So that was, uh, that was a very exciting. We also give out free insect repellent when we do events and speaking engagements. It's just a good conversation starter about the important use of insect repellent and the different types out there that are EPA uh, tested. Um, and then our last thing, we kind of tweaked our Zika virus guide uh, to make it for the general public. It's a guide to Zika virus for you and your family. It mostly contains pictures of potential breeding environments, but a lot of people in our area are just desperate for information. They like the one-stop shopping, and uh, it basically gives them everything they kind of need to know. So if you're interested in any of our resources, this is where you can find them. Of course, we are more than happy to share them with anyone. Uh, and finally, I I would just like to stress, when you're dealing with Zika virus education, don't waste a single opportunity. One speaking engagement always leads to another. You always meet people. You find things out there that you weren't aware that were there. And it's just a way, a way to continue uh, with your partnership and your education initiative. And of course, always embrace the media. I probably educated media can you be your greatest ally. Um, just keep your message simple and, and, and focus on what you're willing to say. And it, it's just so helpful to, to always uh, uh, push for those interviews. Uh, and then turn a mosquito complaint into educational opportunity. Anytime someone calls you and they're having a problem, you have a chance to educate them uh, for life, hopefully. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. This is my contact information. If I can help anyone at any time, please let me know. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That was phenomenal as usual. I think everyone can tell that you have spent a lot of time talking about mosquito control and spreading your messages. Um, and I'm, I'm so impressed uh, about how you've taken the time to really think through and improve your strategies on inspections and your cover letters. And you're really, you're an example of quality improvement. Um, so thank you so much. And I'm going to uh, move over to our next presenter now, James. Uh, James Sayers is a vector control supervisor for the St. Louis County Department of Public Health. James graduated from the University of Missouri in 2006 with a Bachelor of Science degree in biology and a certificate in conservation biology. He is currently licensed with the Missouri Department of Agriculture as a certified public operator in pest health uh, public health pest control. 
and has worked for St. Louis County Department of Public Health as a vector control specialist since 2006 and has been supervisor since March 2016. Thank you so much, James, for joining us. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. Just waiting for my presentation to come up here. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get to the next slide momentarily. Um, probably a million other things I could say about you while we're waiting. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, um, I'm, my name is James Sayers, and, and like I said, I'm a vector control supervisor here at St. Louis County. Um, There we go. Okay, um, basically my objectives today, um, we'll give you guys a, a little bit of a background on our program here in St. Louis County. Um, kind of talk to you a bit about how we are preparing for Zika and, and how we plan to respond to any suspected cases that we come across. Um, and then I'll talk to you guys about our, our Public Health Foundation Quality Improvement Project that we've been working with Vanessa on. Um, we decided to do our project on uh, basically uh, increasing our surveillance to include AZ albopictus as well as other species. Uh, we provide uh, vector control services to all of unincorporated St. Louis County, and we contract with the majority of the 90 or so municipalities that, that are also included in St. Louis County. Um, that covers, uh, we cover almost all 532 square miles of St. Louis County. Um, we do this with four full-time vector control specialists. Um, each of us kind of have our own um, niche. Um, we also uh, our budget allows for up to 12 seasonal vector control assistance every season. Our services include uh, larva siting. Um, we currently maintain about, uh, give or take, 6,000 sites throughout the county. Um, we also do ULV spraying. Uh, I believe last year, 2015, we logged about just under 800 hours of ULV spraying. Um, we also uh, conduct a lot of barrier treatments, um, parks, uh, schools, playgrounds, um, athletic fields, things like that. Uh, we also do uh, a lot of surveillance. We have about 230 trap sites uh, located throughout the county. Um, we collect those mosquitoes, we sort them, ID them, and then uh, we test Culex mosquitoes for uh, West Nile virus um, using RAMP, and we're working on um, a protocol to start doing ELISA testing. And we also do rodent control services in the county here. Um, we take care of rodent control on, on public areas, and we also talk with private residents um, on how to treat rodents on their own property. James, this is Dave. Let me interrupt you a second. We had a question about what count, what state St. Louis County was in. I answered to the person, but it is Missouri. Um, so it, that's the county surrounding the city of St. Louis, Missouri. Correct. Yeah, St. Louis is, is uh, one of the strange cities in, in the nation um, where we are actually, the county is separate from the city. And then within St. Louis County, um, we're kind of a hodgepodge of, um, there's a lot of municipalities um, I, like I said, I believe we got a little over 90 municipalities and then uh, quite a bit of unincorporated county. And uh, we do cover all of unincorporated and we contract with the majority of municipalities to, to take care of their mosquito control for them. Okay, and moving on, um, with regards to Zika virus, uh, what are we expecting? Um, we expect to see um, travel associated cases here. Um, up till now, we've seen probably about four or five uh, suspected travel cases. Um, with regards to local transmission, uh, we do not expect to see local transmission, and if we do, we're, we're hoping um, that it's pretty limited. Um, however, either way, we are prepared to deal with it. Um, as everybody's heard already, the, the two main vectors of Zika, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, Um, Aegypti, um, the main vector of Zika virus, uh, prefers to live near and feed on humans. Um, we have not identified uh, Aedes aegypti in the county, which is a good thing. And Aedes albopictus um, arrived in St. Louis County around the mid-80s. Um, these days it's, it's fairly common, especially when it starts getting pretty hot 
Uh, we typically see a, a big increase in these guys in July, August, and September. Um, they too are a container breeder and um, they're an opportunistic feeder, so they, they will uh, take a bud meal from whatever happens to come their way. And in the county here, um, it, it's always primarily just been a nuisance mosquito until now. So when everybody uh, first started talking about uh, Zika virus, um, we figured our, our first step was going to be communication. Um, we kind of talked amongst ourselves, uh, the vector control staff here in the county, um, we talked with um, our own St. Louis County Communicable Disease Services, the, the epidemiologists with them. Um, we also uh, talked with a lot of the, the local vector control agencies. Um, some of the municipalities around us, they, they have their own health departments, their own vector controls. Um, and we're all fairly, fairly good at uh, contacting one another and, and keeping in a kind of a constant communication with what we're seeing. Um, and we also uh, spoke with um, representatives from the state health department here in Missouri as well as the CDC. Um, with vector control, um, we kind of sat around our, our little table there. We, we like to gather under our, our big uh, mosquito there. And uh, the first thing we asked is, um, you know, how do we include Aedes albopictus in our control efforts? Up until now, we, we primarily, uh, you know, concentrate on, on Culex mosquitoes and, and West Nile virus. Uh, but now with um, Aedes albopictus possibly becoming a, a vector of Zika, uh, we figured we needed to kind of discuss what we needed to do with on our own program to, to make sure that we include those in our efforts. Um, the next step was uh, we kind of looked into researching effective methods to control that species of mosquito. And then once we kind of gathered all of our information together, we, we sat down and we determined how we can effectively respond to Zika with, with our current resources. Uh, once we kind of figured out what we needed to do within our own department, um, then we kind of talked to um, our CDCS, uh, the EPI staff. Um, whenever there is a suspected case here in Missouri, um, the state is usually the first to hear about it. Um, it's reported to them, and then they notify um, our local CDCS, the epidemiologists, and then um, <clears throat> they usually let us know where we're seeing those cases. So in the past, we have had some, some kind of communication breakdowns with them uh, with regards to West Nile virus cases. Uh, sometimes we, we would hear about them and sometimes we wouldn't. So, so we wanted to meet with them to, to kind of get on the same page and, and make sure that when they are made aware of a suspected case that they alerted us to that case so that we could respond accordingly. Um, and we established a primary and secondary contacts um, with both of our departments and, and made sure everybody had each other's contact information uh, so that nothing would fall through the gaps. Um, and like I said, um, there's a lot of actors in St. Louis County here. Um, a lot of people do some of their own vector control work. Um, there's a couple other different health departments uh, within some of the municipalities around us um, and other government agencies. So we kind of reached out to everybody and, and, and others reached out to us. Um, basically to, to cooperate and share information. Um, one of the outcomes of that was uh, a lot of the local players got together and we participated in a, a Zika outbreak tabletop exercise. Um, that included us here in St. Louis County, uh, representatives from St. Louis City, St. Charles County, uh, which borders us to the to kind of the northwest, um, Jefferson County, which borders us to the south, um, and then some of our, our friends over in Illinois, um, St. Clair and Madison County, which are, are directly to the east of us. So. Everybody kind of gathered together, and, and we, we kind of worked through, um, you know, a, a, an outbreak scenario and, and kind of made sure that everybody knew what their roles and responsibilities would be. And then we all kind of talk about, you know, what everybody does, or what our programs encompass, and, and offered any assistance we could possibly provide um, to other agencies and, and kind of see if anybody maybe had any resources that, that they could assist us with. Um, like I said, uh, we also kind of, uh, the CDC is a great resource. Um, all information regarding Zika and, and other vector-borne diseases, their website is excellent. Um, we participated in, in a lot of webinars that the CDC put on regarding Zika. Um, they held a Zika summit, which was very informative. Uh, we participated in some teleconferences um, that the CDC provided. Um, they have plenty of fact sheets and, and information on their website um, regarding everything from uh, control to, to response to 
um, you know, how to deal with the public. Um, and they also uh, send out updates through email, kind of letting everybody know uh, what any current events are with regards to Zika. So once we kind of talked to everybody and, and, and kind of saw what we needed to do, we'd, it was time to kind of sit down and put a plan together. So um, we sat down um, ourselves and, and our CDCS staff and, and we put together a preliminary Zika action plan. Um, basically the plan outlines the roles and responsibilities of our parties involved. Uh, it defines how everyone is to respond to suspected travel association or local transmission of Zika virus. And we meet regularly. About every two or three weeks, we kind of meet to discuss um, where we're at currently. Uh, we kind of review what we've done and make a constant improvement to our response plans. And, and our Zika action plan is not finalized. It's, it's kind of a work in progress, but, but it's, it's, it's coming together pretty well. And like I said, um, the plan defines uh, all responsible parties' um, responsibility. So, with regards to, to vector control, um, it, it defines in detail what we are to do in in response to a suspected travel-related case or um, a suspected local transmission if that occurs. So, with regards to travel-associated cases, um, basically the way we to those is, is we verify that all known breeding sites have been treated. Um, we also send inspectors out to resurvey the vicinity and, and kind of look for any breeding sites that we may have missed. And um, if we do locate additional sites, we make sure that they're treated and we add them to our route to, to be continually monitored through the season. Um, we also conduct a ULV treatment of the area. Uh, we do send the trucks out, even though, you know, like Cheryl said, the spraying is not the most effective way to treat for Aedes albopictus. Um, but we will try to get a truck out there just to kind of ease people's minds and, and, and do what we can. Um, you know, Alopectus is kind of active at dusk, so we, we'll get the trucks out and we'll just kind of start spraying a little bit before sundown just to try to catch anything that may be flying at that time. Um, and the patients are also consulted on mosquito control methods and preventing bites. So we try to stress to them the importance of making sure, you know, if, if they've been, um, if they do possibly have Zika virus, you know, to make sure that they try to prevent bites to introduce that virus to local mosquito populations um, and make sure that there's no mosquito breeding habitat on their property. Um, if we do by chance see local transmission, um, in addition to the actions that we would take in response to a travel case, um, we will also conduct intensive mosquito control activities uh, within the CDC recommended 150 yard radius of that property. Um, we will also do um, a little enhanced surveillance to, to see if Aedes albopictus is present around that case. Um, we'll also, you know, again, check and make sure that there are no additional breeding sites around there that, that we've overlooked. Um, and we'll also kind of go door to door and, and, you know, offer free inspections, try to, try to reduce any possible breeding habit that we can. Um, and we're also prepared to do handheld and truck mounted ULV treatments um, around that area as well as barrier treatments. James, we have a question I'd like to interject here. Um, when does St. Louis mosquito surveillance begin and end each year? How frequently are traps checked? And what is the annual budget for the surveillance effort? Um, prices, I guess. <laughs> right. As, as far as when we begin treatment um, or begin trapping, we, we typically start seeing mosquitoes oh, anytime around April, um, depending on the temperature. It's really seasonal. Our, our temperatures here vary quite, quite widely uh, during our season. So uh, we try to begin trapping usually around the end of April, beginning of May. And like I said in the past, those efforts have typically, you know, concentrated on QX mosquitoes. Um, we began uh, trapping specifically for 80s, I, I would say around the end of May. Like I said, we typically don't start seeing those guys in, until it starts warming up around here. Um, so we started putting the traps out for those around the end of May. And, and we'll continue that through usually September or October. Um, as far as um, the other specifics, I, I should be getting to that a little bit later in the presentation here. And, and if I don't hit it, let me know again, and I'll be happy to answer that. That's fine. Thanks. Um, also, with regards to our Zika action plan, um, 
what we define it as well is is our normal operations, um, everything that we are doing currently, and and then we define anything that we will do differently due to Zika virus. Um, like I said, our normal operations include larviciding, um, ULV spraying, barrier treatments. Uh, we do do some public education, and um, our surveillance. So some of the things that we're we're doing a little differently in in response to Zika. Um, with regards to larviciding, we, we've rerun all of our larvicide sites and kind of reevaluated them. Um, again, trying to find anything that we may have missed in the past. Um, you know, some sites, um, the, the sites change. Some sites need to be added. Some sites are deleted. And, and just trying to make sure we cover all of our ground with regard to breeding sites. Um, we accomplish this through field inspections and also through service requests. Uh, we get a lot of phone calls from our residents um, with questions about standing water, you know, hey, my neighbor's pool is not being treated, um, things like that. Um, there's a swamp behind my house, um, and we'll send um, an inspector out there to take a look at that and, and kind of evaluate it and determine if it is indeed something that we need to be taken care of. Uh, we've also instructed our field staff, um, you know, while they're out in the field, keep an eye out for um, Aedes albopictus. Um, you know, uh, even small containers, tire piles, uh, buckets, trash, dump sites, things like that. Um, and to kind of make note if they're out in the field and, and they notice that, that they're actually getting bit by adult albopictus, and then we kind of make a note of that and, and get out there and, and do some further inspections. Uh, with regards to adult deciding, um, like we've said, nighttime spraying is not an effective means of albopictus. It's, it's primarily active during the day. Um, but they do kind of have a, a bit of a peak time, you know, early morning and, and um, at dusk. So we've, we've kind of had the guys uh, get out there um, and start spraying just a little bit earlier to kind of catch those dust mosquitoes. And then we've also begun um, doing some early morning spraying. So we'll get the trucks out, you know, about two hours before daylight and, and we'll basically spray until dawn. Um, there's also some options with regard to spraying. Um, since the albopictus are primarily a day mosquito and, and they're resting at night, um, one thing that we've acquired that we're, we're going to start trying is um, a product called Aqua Duet. And um, it, it apparently has a, an ingredient that they, they call a benign agitator. And it's, uh, it's primarily supposed to kind of get those resting mosquitoes uh, flying so that hopefully um, you do get a little bit more of effect with your nighttime ULV operations. Um, we've we've not used that yet, but we're hoping to to maybe give that a shot and and try to do some some possible field trials on our own to to see if that actually works. Um, we'll get out there and spray with that, and then do some trapping to see if it it does make any kind of a, uh, effect on our on our albopictus populations. And and we've also um, increased our barrier treatments quite a bit. Um, we're trying to hit a lot of the parks, um, athletic fields. Um, we get a lot of phone calls um, for outdoor events. Um, so if there's outdoor concerts or anything like that, we'll we'll get out ahead of time and, and kind of do a barrier treatment around the property to try to protect those guys. Um, and like Cheryl said as well, public education is, is key with, with regards to Aedes albopictus. Um, since albopictus is a container breeder and, and it's found in close association with humans, we felt increasing public education would be key in, in Zika prevention here in the county. Um, and we needed to make the public aware of the importance of eliminating standing water and, and how they can prevent and reduce those mosquito populations on their own property. And, and we accomplished this through uh, media interviews. Um, we've done a lot of local TV spots. Um, we've done some interviews with uh, local papers, uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, um, as well as some uh, radio engagements. And um, we also provide free inspections for our residents. So if residents call, and, and like Cheryl is doing, if, if we get you know uh, uh, mosquito complaints, we, we try to go out there. Uh, provide a free inspection for them, and a lot of times uh, we do find that that they're actually causing their own problems. Um, so we'll get out there and we'll we'll kind of help them. Uh, we'll consult with them and and try to teach them and educate them to to help take care of themselves and and reduce those numbers of mosquitoes. Um, surveillance, uh, like I said, up until now we've been primarily focused on Culex and West Nile virus, um, but we figured with Zika uh, would be a good time to, to expand our surveillance uh, to include um, Aedes aegypti, or I'm sorry, Aedes albopictus. Um, we've always been aware that they're here, but we've never really, you know, tried to pay attention to exactly where they are and, and what kind of numbers. Um, so we figured now would be a good time to do that. 
Um, and we're doing this through um, additional types of traps that specifically target for Aedes mosquitoes. And since they are active during the day and not at night, we're, we're trying to set at different locations and, and different times of the day. And um, we figured that would be a, a great fit for our quality improvement project through the Public Health Foundation. So our, our Public Health Foundation, our, our quality improvement project, um, like they said, we, we needed to identify an area within our program that we felt needed improvement. Um, Public Health Foundation has provided guidance and quality improvement tools for us to, to develop and implement our quality improvement project. And some of the help we've gotten, um, informational webinars through them. Uh, they've done some site visits with um, their consultant. Uh, Jack Moran was our consultant. He was an excellent resource with putting this uh, project together. Um, participating in monthly check-ins and sending monthly reports in. And um, we've utilized some of the tools uh, provided from them, including the AIM statement, um, the population health driver diagram, and the Gantt chart. So obviously, uh, why we chose the trap for Aedes mosquitoes was uh, the, the Zika threat. Um, as I said, we felt we needed to gain a better understanding of the presence and distribution of different Aedes mosquitoes, um, in particular Aedes uh, albopictus. And um, the data we collected, um, we felt would help us prepare to effectively target and control Aedes albopictus should an outbreak occur. Uh, so obviously the first thing we did, um, we put together our AIM statement. Um, the AIM statement is a tool to, to restrict a problem statement to a discrete issue on which the team can focus. Um, our AIM statement in a nutshell basically states that we need to determine the presence and distribution of Aedes albopictus in St. Louis County and report our surveillance data to our own CDCS and the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. And here's our expanded AIM opportunity statement. Um, it, it's probably hard to read here, but if anybody would like a copy of it, feel free to, to ask and I can provide that. And then the, the next step was our, our Gantt chart. Um, and as with Cheryl, we felt the Gantt chart was, was excellent. It really helped us to get organized and, and kind of put a timeline and a framework together for us to accomplish our goal. Um, the Gantt chart's a tool that lists all your activities required to complete your project, and it provides a timeline to complete each step. And here's a, a copy of our, our Gantt chart. And again, it's, it's kind of hard to read. If, if anybody would like to, to see a, a sample of this, we'd be happy to provide it. And from our Gantt chart, some of our major steps to implement our surveillance project, um, we need to research effective TREPIN methods, um, uh, particularly identify things that, that specifically will target Aedes albopictus. Um, from there, we needed to determine exactly what supplies and any additional equipment we would need. Um, we needed to identify um, trap locations. Uh, most of our trap spots are, are excellent at, at producing Culex. Um, we kind of needed to determine where would be good locations to look for Aedes albopictus. And then we needed to establish our trapping code protocols, um, when we need to set, when we need to pick up, things like that. And then uh, we needed to decide what we really wanted to use this data for, how, how it would um, help us accomplish our goals of, of getting ready for Zika virus and preventing the threat. Um, so some of the trapping methods we researched and, and decided on were um, use of the, the Sentinel-2 trap, the BG Sentinel-2. Um, also their BG Gravid autocidal trap, also called the GAT trap. Um, the CDC light trap and uh, CDC Gravid traps um, that we normally um, use to collect Culex mosquitoes. Um, here's a picture of the Sentinel-2 okay, trap. This James, let me interrupt a second. We have a question that may, perhaps Vanessa can best answer. Can we get the Gantt chart online at uh, uh, Vanessa, is that part of your train program, or can they go through the Public Health Foundation to get a Gantt chart template? Um, yeah, there's multiple templates for Gantt charts. Um, we have uh, almost all of these tools are available on our website, and some of the basic QI tools like Gantt charts are available in the Public Health Quality Improvement Encyclopedia. Um, I will, I'll put in a response to everyone with those websites right now. Great. Thank you. Sorry, James. Oh, no problem. Okay, here's a, a picture of uh, one of our Sentinel-2 traps out in the field. 
the Sentinel-2 trap was developed a trap for, for Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus that, that are, are what they consider questing mosquitoes, mosquitoes that are actively seeking a blood meal. Um, and they, the trap itself um, uses uh, chemical attractants to attract the mosquitoes. Um, they include a, a human skin lure, um, an octanol lure, and uh, you can also supplement with carbon dioxide, either through a, a CO2 tank or um, what we use as, as dry ice buckets. Um, the Sentinel-2 traps are, are easy to deploy. They're, they're easy to collect. Um, they're a huge improvement over the, the Sentinel-1 design that they pretty much just, they're spring-loaded, they pop right up, and you hook them up to the battery, and they're good to go. Um, and they do require an external power source to, to run the fan. Um, the BG GAT trap, here's a picture of that. Um, that is, is out in the field as well. Um, the GAT trap was designed to collect gravid 80s mosquitoes that, that are seeking a place to lay their eggs. Um, those are very simple to deploy and collect. Um, they retain the, the dead mosquitoes without damage. The mosquitoes fly in to lay their eggs. Um, they cannot get to the water source due to a net. And then when they try to exit the, the trap, um, they kind of bounce along the top, which has been coated with permethrin, and, and then they, they die and fall to the net. Um, and studies are also showing that, that down, um, especially South America, where they do have a, a huge Zika problem, that, that these are, are becoming a, a great means of control. Um, gravid uh, female mosquitoes are, are flying them to lay their eggs, and obviously they're dying, and, and they're not laying those eggs. So they're, they're finding that these are actually really good for reducing numbers of Aedes aegypti. Um, some of the benefits, um, the GAT trap does not require a power source. Um, since it's a gravid trap, you, you do need to make a, a hay infusion, a hay infusion to, as an attractant for the mosquitoes. Um, and another benefit is, uh, since there's no power source, we can leave those out in the field for a longer period of time. And they're also really inexpensive compared to some of the other traps. Um, here's a CDC light trap. Um, the CDC light trap, um, they're good at attracting many different species of mosquitoes. So they're not particularly looking just for Aedes albopictus. Um, they will bring in a lot of other types of mosquitoes. Um, they use a light bulb or, or a black light as the attractant. And one of the downsides of this particular trap is they also tend to catch a lot of non-mosquitoes. We get a lot of moths and flies and, and different things in there. Uh, so they take a little bit more time to, to sort through your catch. Um, you can also use these in conjunction with CO2 um, to increase your catch rate. Um, typically when we use them with CO2, we, we do see that they, they catch a lot more mosquitoes. Um, and they also require a power source to run the light bulb in the fan. And here's kind of our bread and butter trap um, for particularly Culex mosquitoes. This is the CDC Gravid trap. Um, like I said, uh, we use the gravid traps to focus on Culex mosquitoes, but in the past we've, we've also noted that we do catch a, a few non-Culex mosquitoes in those traps. So, so we decided it would be pretty beneficial to kind of use that data and, and make note of any non-Culex mosquitoes that we collect from these um, along with our um, Aedes albopictus surveillance data. Um, the gravid trap requires a, an external power source as well, and um, it uses a, a hay, grass, chicken manure infusion uh, that we finally call a stink bait because it's pretty nasty stuff um, to attract the Culex mosquitoes. Uh, Culex mosquitoes tend to prefer really polluted, nasty water, so that that's excellent at pulling in the Culex. Um, we had to identify any additional supplies or equipment we would need, so obviously uh, we needed to accumulate um, traps that specifically target albopictus, um, trap batteries, spare nets, the chemical lures, um, dry ice, and and all of the ingredients that we needed to, to make our hay infusion for the gravid traps. Um, our next step was uh, determining trap locations. Um, we decided just um, out of simplicity, we, we decided to utilize our, our existing trap sites. Uh, most of our trap sites throughout the county have kind of a site A and a site B. Um, so when we would set those particular sites, we would put a, a a Culex trap, you know, in one part, and then we would set um, the traps targeting 80s uh, species in the other. Um, we also decided to kind of concentrate on sites where we've previously trapped Alopectus in our Culex traps. Um, so we, we're trying to set those areas a little bit more because we know that they, they already have Alopectus, 
as well as you know places where we haven't found them just to see if, if the albopictus traps do do find them in those areas. And we've also sat down and did a lot of brainstorming, um, you know, places where we've been conducting other activities. If, if we've noticed um, areas where, where we've been bitten by adults in the past, and, and we decided to try to make a list of those spots and, and trap there as well. Um, next up was establish trapping protocols. We, we sat down and, and we had to determine, um, you know, uh, who's going to pick the trap sites, um, who do we want to have set the traps, who do we want to retrieve the traps, when do we want them set and retrieved, um, and how long are the traps to remain in the field. Um, like I said, we've, we've been um, we've been setting our Q-Lake traps um, probably since about the beginning of May. Um, we really began getting our albopictus traps out uh, around the end of May. And initially we, we did not catch very much, um, and we kind of expected that because it, it was still a, a little cool out for, for that particular type of mosquito. Um, now that we're getting in the warmer months, we are starting to see our, our albopictus pick up quite a bit, especially within the, the last week or two. Um, but basically our trapping protocols, our, our CDC gravid traps, our sentinel traps, and our light traps, um, those are set early afternoon by our vector control assistants, and then um, another assistant will retrieve them before noon the following day. So we're able to keep those in the field for just about 24 hours. Um, if they stay out longer than that, then the batteries tend to go dead and, and uh, that fan is not running to, to keep those mosquitoes in the net. So we try to collect them before the batteries run dry. Um, the GAT traps, since they don't require any power, we're able to leave those out a little longer. We, we set those out. They sit out in the field um, usually about five to seven days. Um, vector control assistant will set those traps on a Monday and typically we try to pick them up before noon on the following Friday. And then the, the next thing, um, what are we going to do with all this data? So as our, our data was coming in, um, we decided to map areas where, where we're finding Aedes albopictus. Um, we're sharing what we find with other agencies. Uh, we provide updated trap results to, to the state and uh, to our own CDCS um, every Friday. We share our data. And we're using our, our maps and, and where we find these mosquitoes um, to increase our control efforts in public education. So places where we're finding a lot of Aedes albopictus, we're, we're kind of going through those neighborhoods a little more, making our presence known a little better, talking to some of the residents, and um, increasing our, our larva sighting and, and ULV efforts there. Um, some of the data we've collected so far, um, we're finding Aedes albopictus, and, and we've also found a, a lot of other mosquitoes that we typically don't see in our Culex traps. Um, we've identified albopictus, Aedes vexens, um, a couple species of Anopheles mosquito, um, Aclaritatis japonicus, which is actually very similar to Aedes aegypti, um, Aclaritatis triceriatus, Aclaritatis trivitatis, um, Signifera, uh, a couple of species, and Uritania. And here's some examples of uh, what we're doing with our mapping. Um, on the left there, uh, since we didn't have a whole lot of albopictus data yet, uh, we included uh, what we found last season as well as what we found currently up to this season. And uh, on the right, we also uh, are using our mapping to kind of keep track of our, our positive West Nile pools. And I'd like to thank everybody, um, the Biodefense Network, uh, David Reddick and Harlan, um, as well as the Public Health Foundation, Jack Moran and Vanessa Lammers. Uh, everybody's been a, a great help with uh, our project here. James, thank you very much. Uh, and Vanessa and Cheryl, thank you as well. Cheryl, I love your SWAT team approach. I think that's really cool. Uh, and James, I uh, appreciate very much. We have one question, for, I guess for both Cheryl and James, uh, one more question. That is that if the, uh, if the fogging uh, is not that effective, why are we continuing to do it? And uh, are there any long-term uh, effects of the chemicals that are sprayed? So James or Cheryl, do you want to take that quickly? Sure, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, even though ULV fogging for albopictus is, is not very effective, um, depending on the time of day you, you do it, uh, typically our, our truck-mounted ULV machines, um, you really do not want to run those during the day. Uh, basically, the sunlight kind of and, and the thermals will, will take that product and just carry it up in the atmosphere, and it won't do any good for anything. Um, but we have found that there's some parts of the county here where we can fog during daylight, 
Um, typically some areas where there's just a lot of cover, um, you get in some really shady areas. And, and also what we do is a, a lot of handheld farm. So we had handheld ULV machines where we can really concentrate in areas where we have a lot of thick brush that, that harbor albopictus as well as other mosquitoes. Um, as far as residual, um, basically ULV chemicals, um, they're designed to come out of the machine, they will disperse, and usually about 15, 30 minutes, they're, they're virtually gone with no residual. Okay. Thank you, James. So for all of our attendees, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, on behalf of the Public Health Foundation and Biodefense Network, thank you for being here today. Keep an eye out for our next webinar, which is scheduled for Wednesday, August 24th, on the opioid crisis, what local public health departments are doing with that. Thank you all very much for joining us, and thank you all for the participants. We appreciate it. Good day, everyone.